We have this notion that somehow if you're poor, you cannot do it. Poor kids are just as bright and just as talented as white kids. I mean, you got the first sort of mainstream African American yeah. who is articulate and bright and, and, and clean and nice looking guy. I mean, it's, that's a storybook, man. Unlike the African American community, with notable exceptions, the Latino community is an incredibly diverse community with incredibly different attitudes about different things. You cannot go to a 7-Eleven or a Dunkin' Donuts unless you have a slight Indian accent. It's a fully, I'm not, I'm not joking. It's a long way until November. We got more questions. You got more okay. questions, but I tell you, if you have a problem figuring out whether you're for me or Trump, then you ain't black. It's, it's, it's an indicator of taking black people for granted. It's a way of saying, we got y'all. It's a way of saying, I can be overconfident because I know that you guys always vote Democrat. I can predict how you guys are gonna vote. And, and, I, and I know that you guys have already bought into the narrative that Trump is racist, right? So as long as I'm not Trump, I can do whatever I wanna do. I can say whatever I, what I, what I wanna say, and I don't have to worry about you and any of your concerns and being intelligent enough to speak to your concerns intelligently. Now you don't know my state. My state was a slave state. My state is a border state. He's going to let the big banks once again write their own rules. Unchain Wall Street. They're going to put you all back in chains. And I can tell you, as someone who was a little brown girl, I found Joe Biden's words very condescending indeed. And I think uh, a lot of other brown girls would have felt the same way. I think the two-party system, although my Democratic colleagues don't like me saying this, I think the two-party system is good for the South and good for the Negro, good for the black in the South. Um, and uh, uh, other than the fact that they still call me boy, I don't think they've, I think they've changed their mind. <laughs> Biden sought and received support from Mississippi Senator James Eastland, the Democratic chairman of the Judiciary Committee and a leading symbol of Southern resistance to desegregation. He frequently spoke of blacks as, quote, an inferior race. He said surprising. Surprising in what way? Well, the fact that he would solicit the support of a staunch uh, segregationist, uh, James Eastland, as well as Jesse Helms. In terms of foreclosures, in terms of bad loans that were being, I mean, these Shylocks who took advantage. Specifically, have you taken a cognitive no, test? No, I haven't taken a test. Before you got in this program, you take a test where you're taking cocaine or not? What do you think, huh? Are, are you a junkie? What do you say? to President Trump, who... Why in this nation do black Americans wake up knowing that they could lose their life in the course of just living their life? They gotta know we're listening. Now is the time for racial justice. We have such an opportunity now to change people's lives for the better. It's about who we are, what we believe, and maybe most importantly, who we want to be. When I marched in the Civil Rights Movement, I did not march with a 12-point program. I marched with tens of thousands of others to change attitudes. I was involved, but I was not out marching. I was not down in Selma. I was not anywhere else. I was, in fact, very concerned about the civil rights movement. I was not an activist. I worked at an all-black swimming pool in the east side of Wilmington, Delaware. I was involved. I was involved in what, what they were thinking, what they were feeling. I was in law school. I wore sport coats. I was not part of that. I'm serious. I'm not big on flak jackets and tie-dye shirts and, you know, that's not me. More than once, advisors had gently reminded Mr. Biden of the problem with this formulation. He had not actually marched during the civil rights movement and more than once, Mr. Biden assured them that he understood and kept telling the story anyway. That is really, really weird. Now, his aides went back to say, look, he was in office marching for the idea of civil rights, but was not actually marching in the streets. But that would not huh? fly as much. <laughs> but he yeah, was supporting civil rights. But I'm saying that in today's <laughs> that's not the word marching age of Twitter, OK. <laughs> I know, you're just telling what they said. Right, but yeah, but yeah. in the age of Twitter today, Instagram, there would be pictures of him not marching. Right. So you <laughs> cannot get away with that in this moment. So that's his big challenge. This day. 30 years ago, Nelson Mandela walked out of prison and entered into discussions about apartheid. I had the great honor of meeting you. I had the great honor of being arrested with our UN ambassador 
and the streets of Soweto trying to get to see him on Robbins Island. Um, I do want to ask you about one thing that you've said repeatedly on the trail. I think it's three times now. You said that during a visit to South Africa uh, to visit Nelson Mandela, which I know was a very memorable visit for you, that you were arrested when you were there. Your campaign has come out since and said, no, 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 you were separated from other people at the airport. But you did say arrest three yeah. times. What? Why? Well, what I meant to say was, I meant I was not able to, I was not able to move. I guess I, I wasn't arrested. I was stopped. I was not able to move where I wanted to go. I was a kid from suburbia. I lived out in Mayfield in a split level home, but I didn't know any black people. No, I really didn't. You didn't know any white people either. That's the truth. And for, I was the only white employee here. And Corn Pop was a bad dude. And he ran a bunch of bad boys. And so he was up on the board, wouldn't listen to me. I said, hey, Esther, you, off the board, or I'll come up and drag you off. Well, he came off, and I, he said, I'll be waiting for you. He was waiting for three guys in straight razors. Not a joke. There was a guy named Bill Wright, Mouse, the only white guy, and he did all the pulls. He was the mechanic, and he cut off a six-foot length of chain. He folded up, he said, you walk out with that chain. And you walk to the car and say, you may cut me, man, but I'm going to wrap this chain around your head. So I walked out with the chain. I said, first of all, I said, when I tell you to get off the board, you get off the board, and I'll kick you out again. But I shouldn't have called you, Esther Williams. I apologize for that. I apologize, but I didn't know that apology was going to work. He said, you apologize to me? I said, I apologize for that. Not for throwing you out, but I apologize for what I said. He said, okay, close the straight razor, and my heart began to beat again. So I learned about roaches. So I learned about roaches. So I learned about roaches. President, in talking about the continuing recession tonight, you have blamed mistakes of the past. And you blamed the Congress. Does any of the blame belong to you? Yes, because for many years I was a Democrat. <laughs> but does any... You know, someone very profoundly once said many years ago that if fascism ever comes to America, it'll come in the name of liberalism.